Welcome to the North Shore Fellowship Podcast, a place to explore the intersection of God's story and our lives. Welcome back to the second part of a two-part series on Solomon's stupidity and ours. At the end of last week's episode, I introduced some verses from Ephesians chapter 2 that remind us that the world, the flesh, and the devil are all conspiring against us to lead us into sin. And that's true in Solomon's life as well. So we're going to dip back into Solomon's life and see how the world, the flesh, and the devil affected him. So let's talk about one element of that. Let's go back and talk about the world a little bit. We've already mentioned Solomon's social context as being one of the factors that that played in on this. And you can just imagine like a wise counselor in Solomon's day saying, look, you, you need to add a couple more wives. You've got a problem with Assyria over here and you've got a potential problem with Egypt. Why don't you solve that problem by adding some more wives, bringing them to your country, making them happy with their religion, their practices. We have the same thing today. People tell us, uh, who, who people who seem to be really wise and seem to be helping us solve a problem, giving us advice to run that runs counter to what what God might say with respect to relationships, for example. Um, and so I, I think this is this is something that we haven't escaped. We're part of the pool of the world, uh, just like Solomon is. We're going to feel that in 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 similar ways. So this helps me a lot. It helps me understand that Solomon really wasn't so stupid. Um, but my other question is, and, and your illustration, Jason, with the playing with the kids and being the star of the middle school, but not Michael Jordan, uh, is so helpful. But I, then I also question why later in his life, like where does sanctification fit in? Why did this happen? I mean, if, if he had first become king and done these things, I could say, okay, but having this later, or, or or is it later in his life? Is it correct that that's the chronology here? Yeah, that's a lot uh, to unpack, Heather. First of all, Solomon is stupid. He's just not more stupid than than we are, right? He's he's not on on, a, on his own level of stupidity. Just like he's he's above me in wisdom, um, but I I think we're all playing on the same level of potential stupidity. Yeah. So for for um for the sanctification piece, let's kind of um, let's unpack that this way. Um, one of the things I like thinking about is, is diagnostics. How do we know that we're engaging in idolatry? Like what, what kind of kinds of telltale signs would there be in our lives? Uh, Paige Brown and the Bible study that we've been doing for the adult Bible study, looking at the life of Elijah and Elisha, uh, talked about frenzy or chaos as one great barometer that we're engaging in idolatry. Um, I don't think it's the only one though. And I think it's important to remember sometimes the chaos or the frenzy comes well after the sin at, at one particular moment, it may look like I've kind of got it all together. And the sin that I engage in may have actually solved a problem. And, um, you know, as it says in scripture, uh, some, some sins are very conspicuous and some sins like there's a trailing effect the, the the evidence of the sin only comes up much later. And so I know in my life I can, I can engage in sin and only have it really kind of um, come back to bite me, maybe because I didn't deal with something out of uh, insecurity or um, uh, lack of, lack of knowledge or, or willingness to address a problem. And then, and then I kind of cover it up and then later it kind of, it comes up and it really bites me, it really creates the frenzy and the chaos much later. Um, so in Solomon's life, I think what you see is that he probably had a lot of success, even despite his sin, and God doesn't give him the grace of being caught. There's the old mom's prayer, Lord, if my kid screws up, please let them get caught the first time. Solomon wasn't caught the first time. It's very clear that he continues to kind of operate in this. And so um, you, you could say, well, why didn't God help him out? Why didn't God show him how big his mistakes were? Well, um, those are still Solomon's responsibility. That's still Solomon's burden uh, to bear. So I think the ultimate diagnostic for us is, is disobedience. Have I disobeyed the word of God? Because the frenzy may come later, the chaos may come later as a consequence, but um, you have to remember that the ultimate barometer is not whether I've completely screwed my life up or not, or whether it, my life is working or not. It's whether I'm obedient to God or not. This is something that's really important because in, in much of modern counseling, for example, uh, the question is, is your life together, right? Are you happy with where your life is? And if that's the only standard that we have, 
we really are at risk of engaging in, in practices of disobedience that really do take us away from the sanctification to which we are called. And so that's more of that perspective on the world and our sin for Solomon and for us today. So that's the world part of the world, the flesh, and the devil uh, that we see in Ephesians 2. Um, we see how the world influenced Solomon, his position, and uh, the temptations that go along with his position and what he got away with. Uh, how about the flesh aspect? How do we see that unfolding in Solomon's life? So by flesh, Chris, you mean to say, what was it in Solomon's own heart that caused him to sin? Yeah, that's a good way to say that. When we say the world, we kind of mean the outside influences, sort of the temptations that came from outside of him. But he had things going on in his own heart that also made him more likely to capitalize on those things that came out from outside of him. I guess they don't really live totally in separation, but when we're saying the world, the flesh, and the devil— Typically, when we say the flesh, we mean the internal motivations. So when the Queen of Sheba came to him, and so many people were coming, and they were amazed by his wisdom and bringing him gifts, would that cause an internal, like, I I want to, I am the king, I am the person in charge, I want more of this, um, I have complete control? So this is really tricky territory because we don't have access to Solomon's internal apparatus. And so all we right. can do is sort of speculate. I think there is such a thing as, as godly pride, like the affirmation that you've worked well and you've done something good. There's a good result from it. Um, we do want to be encouraged and uh, to continue on in the work that we've been doing that, that has met with some success. And so we certainly, I certainly pray for my staff that they would get encouragement and see some of the fruit and what they're investing in doing. And I would want people to have that Queen of Sheba experience where someone comes from outside and says, this is really, something really good is happening here. So there's probably going to be good internal responses to that. But because we're sinful, you can also imagine that Solomon's response to that might be one of completion rather than dependence, uh, one of uh, having arrived rather than a continual need for revisiting wisdom, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and you never move beyond that. I know from my own life and uh, the, the lives that I have a window into, it's very difficult for us to, um, to stay uh, on, that, on those rails that we start off on. Yeah, I think the example of the Queen of Sheba is a, a good one. And another one that also involves women in this case is his wives. So they, he's, um, you know, he acquires these wives. There's, he is making political treaties as he does so. He is probably following some of his heart lust. Uh, there's another thing that happens there with his wives, though, where they lead him to worship other gods, or at least to build sites dedicated to other gods, high places for Chemish and the abomination of Moab and others that he knew he wasn't supposed to do. And so the question is, why is he doing that? And it doesn't, I'm not, I don't think that has anything to do with keeping the treaty in place. I'm not sure it directly supports his lust, although it may have, but he was certainly experiencing some kind of pressure to do that from them. And he wanted to please them. And so I think, you know, he's got kings and uh, royalty of other kinds coming from all over the place to get his wisdom. And he's used to being looked up to. And then his wives come to him and say, hey, we want you to do this for us. And he wants to please them too. So I think there's some evidence of him being a, a people pleaser, of him changing his standards uh, to, to accommodate what people are asking of him that gets at some kind of internal sin pattern going on in his life. I think it Chris, I think that's right. I think it's important to remember that there's a, a feedback mechanism going on between the flesh and the world, right? It's not just that the world is making me want to do something. It's that I have inside myself the capacity to run after these things. And in some pockets of Christianity, it's very easy to talk about the world out there as if it's the bad thing right. and completely ignore that my own wiring is directed that direction. There's other great examples of, of the complexity of this and the social context uh, where we get our wiring for acceptance and love is, is very out there. It's very from the world around us and our social context, our, our family context. Um, but it also becomes internal. It becomes part of my flesh that I want to be accepted, loved, cared for. I want my needs to be. Um, centered. Yeah, that, um, that's a good point. Like, just take acceptance. You, There is no acceptance outside of 
being in society with other people, which you, that deep longing you have that could drive you has to exist within the context of a community of other people. And you're saying that as an introvert. So have you tried to get acceptance just by yourself? (laughs) Well, I've accepted myself, but I also want you to accept me. Okay. All right. Well, that's good to know. I'll have to work on that. I have in mind things like, you know, the the Kellers point out in their work on marriage that um, you can leave and cleave in more than one way, or you can fail to leave and cleave in more Mm. than one way. You can be completely dependent on your parents and their system of doing things. That's a failure to leave and cleave. Um, But you can also be so hostile to what you were in uh, that your internal needs, the flesh inside you, revolts against, you know, some of the things that were there. And then you run completely away from that and you still haven't left and, and Cloven or cleft? <laughs> What's the past tense? Yeah, you walked Cleaved. into that one, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did. Um, uh, another example of this uh, of this interplay between flesh and world is um, Bonhoeffer's discussion of community and life together, uh, where you can have an ideal of community that is so cherished, you know, by you, and but you you that you love the idea of community more than you love any actual community. So the barometer is obedience, right? Have you loved your brother? Uh, have you served others and helped them flourish? Well, Bonhoeffer points out that it's, it's very easy for us to have this massive ideal of community that, that uh, takes up all of our attention and leads us to actually look down on or denigrate the actual community that we're in. And so there's like uh, something where our flesh desires one particular way of, of living in the world. And, and, and keeps us from loving like in community. So there's, there's a little bit more interplay yeah. between flesh and world. Which is such a disordered love because when you, when you're a Christian and you're thinking about community, the community can be a relief from all of your idols. But if you make the community your idol, you ruin it in the process. So our next category is a lot more complicated. And um, Heather, you're the oldest person in the room. You've had more experience with the devil than the rest of us. Thank you for bringing that up, Jason. Psychology teaches us to pay attention to different social dimensions and uh, a life of living as a Christian. We, I think we're very familiar with uh, sin and our own desires and what those can do to us. I think this category is a little more complicated. The devil. Heather, your thoughts. Yeah, it seems like one complication here is I don't see the devil in this story. Yeah, so let's let's handle that in in two different ways. In, in the first instance, the the biblical story from Genesis to Revelation operates with this enemy of God, right? So you you have uh, you have the the devil, this supernatural personal entity who's working against God's purposes and therefore against God's people using temptation and the like, um, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. There's this conflict that we're engaged in. So I think it's reasonable to say, oh, that's that's present in 1 Kings, even if it's not explicitly stated. And so one thing that we could do is look at other stories where the supernatural dimension is a little more explicit and use that to kind of shed light on, on what's going on. Uh, one way to do this is the story of Judas, right? Judas betrays Jesus for a bag full of money, but there's other passages that tell us there's more going on. In Luke's gospel, Luke 22, it says Satan entered Judas. So there's like a supernatural uh, component working alongside Judas's own desire for money, perhaps, uh, and probably some social pressure, some world pressure uh, to try to get things to a conclusion, perhaps. Maybe we don't, we don't know exactly what that conclusion is, but he, he seems clearly to be trying to execute something out there in the world. And so the Bible can speak of uh, Judas's own motivations, uh, and it can speak of, of those also being the work of Satan. Uh, you see something similar going on in, in Acts chapter 5. Ananias and Sapphira are guilty of the internal sin of greed. They're also falling prey to the world context in which they live, in this case, being married to someone who's corrupt. <laughs> I think that does neither one of them a favor, and they're also falling prey to the devil. Um, Very explicitly, it says that um, uh, Satan has filled Ananias' heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back uh, part of the proceeds of the land. That's Acts 5, 3, and 4. So you do have passages that show you sort of underneath, as it were, uh, the the, the surface story uh, where these other motivations are going on. Um, but Solomon's, Solomon's story shows us that there's, uh, that there's 
internal motivations we don't always have full access to. We kind of have to read between the lines, uh, as dangerous as that might be. And we also need to understand that Satan's at work, uh, even if it's not obvious to us that he's at work. And so is it fair to say that Satan knew a serpent crusher was coming because that had been promised in Genesis 3 after Adam and Eve sinned, but he didn't know who the serpent crusher was. And so he has to work hard to try to stop whoever that may be. And up to this point, Solomon has looked like a pretty good guy. Like, could he be the one? Um, I don't know. I'm not saying Satan was thinking that, but I am saying that he he needs to defeat God's plan. Yeah, and he needs to defeat the anointed son of God and son of David, which Solomon was. So if you're guessing, if you're Satan and you're guessing who's enemy number one, uh, Solomon definitely has a target on his back for being the son of David, the king, and especially being the one given so much wisdom. So a righteous king who's bringing righteousness on the earth and um, putting things in order and making God look good, establishing his people, that's certainly not something that Satan's interested in. So then is it fair to blame everything on the devil if he's got the big picture in mind and he's trying to... I don't think that's the best way to go about it. I think certainly you can always see that Satan is involved, just like you can always see that God is involved. The Bible's really committed to a multi-story universe where there's multiple layers of causation and influence going on. Um, but that doesn't mean that Satan's the sole one responsible for you know, the mistakes that you and I make. So that's why I love the Bible's perspective on this, the world, the flesh, and the devil all coming into play and how you and I act, how you and I think and feel, how we engage in sin in our world. I think we'll wrap up there. Thank you all for listening. I hope you have benefited from us talking about the complexity of our sin, the world, the flesh, the devil conspiring against us. It can feel like there's no hope. But we know that Christ has overcome the world, and although we don't see all the fruit of that today, we do see some of it, and we look forward to experiencing full redemption in Him, of course. In light of that, may you all seek to obey King Jesus and live in ways that are fruitful in His kingdom.